we go. Well, I'm here with uh, Selena Matreya, and we we have had a couple of these over the years. Last one we did got a lot of response, of like, do it again, do it again. So here we are kind of doing it again. Uh, this is kind of a cool time because Selena's new book, which I'll scroll down here, new book, uh, Raise Your Frequency, Transform Your Life, How to Respond with Love to Life's Difficulties, was released on June 11th, 2024. So it's a brand new book, and um, we uh, we thought we'd talk a little bit about the book and how that helps photographers, because Selena is a world-class, world-renowned former photographer's rep turned consultant and uh, probably has forgotten more about marketing photographer photography than any of us will ever, ever know. So welcome, Selena. Well, thank you for that. What a nice introduction. Thank you, Don. It's always good to be here. I love our conversations because they're so informative. And so thank you, everybody, for joining us. We really try to really try to keep some good information and stuff that people can have real action on. And by the way, folks, this is not rehearsed. Selena <laughs> is busy as a uh, one handed paper hanger and I am as well. <laughs> So we uh we he's uh, together and we come and and slam it right here, uh so it's not rehearsed and uh, uh, I hope you get more out of it that way. Um, recently, Selena, I've noticed on uh, a couple different websites, one of them being Rob Haggart's mm. photo editor, uh, where he's asking photographers how much they made. Mm. I don't know if you're tracking that. I'm not um, tracking it. I'm not tracking his um, Instagram conversation. Yeah, not. I'm not tracking his Instagram anymore. But I, I'm very familiar. Rob was a guest of mine when I did my first Clarion call, which was an international telesummit for photographers. So we had photographers all over the world and buyers and experts. And then you know he always recommended me as a consultant on his site. So I'm very familiar. But what's he talking about? Well, he he has photographers. Um, oh, I'll just bring it up here on the. Yeah, obviously it intrigued you, Don. Yes, the, they put on how much they make, mm. um, you know, what are you billing? And there's so many photographers who are, um, here we go, here we go. Let's move to a photo editor here. Uh, photographers that are doing or saying things like um, 2019, 40, here's a 43-year-old photographer, 2023 made 175,000 uh, net. Um, 36 year old male, 28, 28K in 2023, 37K and, um, and 20, uh, oh, net and gross there. But some of them are, are showing very low numbers. Yeah. Um, there's a guy up there. Can you scroll down for just a sec? Sorry. There's a guy here who's also making 350K gross. So I don't want to, that's Canadian, right. but right. you know, want to just make sure we point that out too. Yes. There's there are people doing very Wide well. Range. The, the the ones that that I'm concerned with are the the folks who who do the uh, no they're down here maybe down here a little bit farther yeah uh, yeah pre COVID sixty k post COVID twenty k uh, more of those as you go through here uh, 2023, 267, 2022, 190, 2021. They're on a trajectory of good. Even though it's a real tough world out there, they're on a trajectory mm -hmm. of good. Um, and you, you know, my question would be, one of the things I would really advise people to think when they look at this is we don't know what their marketing was before COVID, right? What it was during COVID and what it was after. Because you know, Don, when COVID hit, one of the things I did I was very concerned about our industry and I was an active consultant then. So I offered all the photographers, I had a, a photography list of about 2,800 photographers at that point, because I had lectured 150 times within 10 years through APA, ASMP and CAPIC in Canada. And I was really concerned. So I sent out a note to my entire list and said, look, I am very concerned about what's happening. I am offering free consultations to as many people as need them. 
up to an hour and a half to help you plan for how you're gonna manage your time for however long this takes. And, but the only caveat is you have, to, you have to meet with me afterwards, once again for free, so I can see what you've done and help you continue. Out of 2,800 emails that went out, I got 150 responses, of which 80 people followed up and had meetings with me. I gave away 80 appointments twice. Wow. And I met with photographers guiding them. Now, I'm not saying this so people can go, wow, Celine is great. I'm saying, look at the numbers, 2,800 down to 160, down to 80 that actually had the appointments with me because those were the people that responded. So the, what, what I want to just share is that when we look at these numbers, we don't know how many people marketed where they were at before COVID, what they did during COVID, because a lot of people did nada. And that was the best time to reach out to the people you had relationships with and the people you were really that you had marketed to that you wanted a relationship with, but couldn't get in to see, or they hadn't quite come yet, which was what I was doing with the photographers that, that took me up on my offer. And so people that did nothing during that time are having a harder time now. Now, not to say that that fees aren't down in some parts of our market or things haven't changed. I hear all of that. I get all of that. But I just wanted to put a little bit of um, reality behind those numbers. And I think that's where my, my uh, topic uh, came from is because there seems to be a, uh, an innate fear and a lot of photographers to do the work that they know will pay off. Mm -hmm. they, I know that if you market, it will pay off. In fact, um, anyone in advertising will tell you, you, you advertise enough, you'll sell that widget. Mm -hmm. And yet yeah. I can't get photographers to move off the dime. It's like, oh, making cold calls are so, is so hard. Yeah, starving is harder. Having to sell your gear and give up your studio is harder than cold calling. It really, really is. Also, we have options. Cold calling, you know, should be front-ended by other material. Sure. And I agree with you. Um, and this is the reality, at least when I left the industry, which was just this past January. So I can't imagine the world has changed that much in three months. There was no doubt about the fact that prior to COVID, we were marketing more. Uh, we had to market a lot more in order to achieve what we had just a few years ago. So COVID made it more difficult because people, I don't know what percentage, but a, a decent percentage of people are still not back in offices. Companies are requiring people to be in offices more. And that does impact marketing in terms of direct mail. But we've done workarounds with in-person visits, um, doing Zoom in-person visits, and there were other suggestions. Social media stepped up, uh, email, which people are still responding to quite well as of January, we stepped up. So there's no doubt about the fact that photographers still have to market even more than ever before. And I get it, that's really hard, it's more expensive, it takes more time, but that's the reality. Right when COVID hit, the photographers I was working with who really had consistent marketing, they were the people doing quite well. And as always, the people that were either intermittent in their marketing or didn't have a robust enough program, one that had three to five ways of reaching people, where people who didn't market at all clearly were suffering. Yes. And it, it, always, it always, in the end, comes down to marketing. Um, Portfolios, as you know, because you're you've built so many beautiful portfolios for so Thank many you. photographers over the years. Portfolios are a big part of it, but if you don't market, then nobody gets to see the beautiful portfolio. And mm -hmm. so it it doesn't have as much impetus. The idea of building a great portfolio is to get it in front of the people who recognize great portfolios and want to hire you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think what we're talking about today has everything to do with whether people do their marketing and get their work out in front of people or not. I would love to find out how we can get rid of the fear that market that mm -hmm. photographers seem to have over marketing, over doing the things that they want. 
Um, I read your book. I bought a copy, by the way. I, I, I appreciate you. you no, I know you would have, but what's the fun in that? So, <laughs> So, well, thank I'm, you for I'm, your support, Don. I certainly. appreciate that. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I thought, you know, when you talk about raising your frequency, mm -hmm. that's so much a part of, mm -hmm. of it all, of all of it, really. Um, to, uh, explain it. Well, first of all, the, the best way for me to explain this is to say to people, while this is a book that could be characterized as spiritual, I think it's very holistic. When I wrote my second book, How to Succeed in Commercial Photography, it was a book of essays, a book that was broken down into vision, values, team, tools, persistence, and faith. And faith is not religious, faith is spiritual. And I wrote that book as a crossover book. I wanted photographers to understand how to have a successful life in photography. Um, and so each essay was from a, myself or it was from a buyer or it was from an agent or a very successful photographer. And we spoke about a, a specific topic under those topics. And so in its totality, that book was meant to be a, a guide for photographers. And part of what, what guided that book was frequency, was the energy that we hold. So that book is still available. Photographers can pick that up. It's a bestseller. It was in several printings. Um, I'm mentioning it now because the, this book, Raise Your Frequency, Transform Your Life, is all about showing people, teaching people how to recognize where they are in any moment of their day in terms of am I in low frequency, which is fear of multiple stripes, or am I open and in high frequency, I'm vibing, I'm at peace, I'm in neutrality, I'm feeling good. And that is important, why? Because science has told us, this is so, I love this, that the brain does not create a new. What the brain does is it recognizes that which it knows and creates structure around it. Well, what the brain knows, what it recognizes is frequency. This is why we have EKGs, we have EEGs that measure the frequency in the brain and the frequency in the heart. So what we're doing with this work is I'm teaching people how to recognize as they move through the day what frequency they're in, because we go back and forth continually throughout the day. And most people are moving through the day without any recognition whatsoever as to where they are. And the only way we can shift our state is to become conscious of where we are. And then there's a process that the book teaches us, several processes to, to transform from a state of fear, which could look like procrastination. It could look like being stuck. It can look like jealousy. It can look like anger. It can look like frustration. We all know, you know, fear has so many different faces. So when we recognize ourselves in one of those states, there's a pro there are processes that we can use to immediately transform into higher vibration. And it's not mystical. Well, I think it actually is mystical, but it's very practical. Um, as a consultant, I taught photographers how to take their vision and build them into portfolios that sell. I taught them how to take this incredible talent they were given and to develop it. And then I taught them the very specific tools of how to sell that vision and that body of work. All very practical. But photography, as we talked about before, Don, in its essence, is not only practical, it's mystical. So it makes perfect sense for photographers who are channeling down the energy that tells them exactly when to click the shutter, the energy in the studio that guides them to direct a model or direct a subject. That isn't just intellect. That has to do with opening up channels to the divine because as Leonardo da Vinci said, all creativity is a gift 
of the divine. All creativity is a, ma is a manifestation, is a physical manifestation of the divine. And photography has been defined as the combination of science and magic. So what I'm hoping through this conversation and our conversations and the program we've created together is to introduce photographers who are already working with these energies to introduce them to how the same frequency that helps them to create a photograph can also help them to change their state so that when they are suffering, and suffering is a good word, from low frequency and they're, they're in stasis or they're in procrastination, they have tools to move them forward. I wish I had had this information when I was a consultant. I would yes. have been a heck of a lot, even, even more of a consultant and an yeah, asset sure. to my clients. You're a good 30 years late for me. <laughs> Uh, oh, and 30 years but, late for a lot of other photographers, but, but things go given better, to us when they are. Better now than never. Better yes. now than never. And I so. needed that. I needed that. I've been a spiritual student, Don, since I was 16 years old, and my name was given to me. But clearly, I wasn't ready for this book until now, because it sure. was, you know, given to me 11 years ago, and it took that long to create. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we, you know, everything, everything comes at its own pace. And um, no doubt, I, I think that uh, the very lucky among us recognize when, those things when they come to us and take action. And we work our butts off. Yeah, well, <laughs> You've yeah. done the same, right? Look at your career shifts over time. I've known you for a very long time, right? Yep, absolutely. You knew me when I was a photographer and a designer and yep. uh, now a teacher. So yeah, it's been really, really, really great. When, when, you get um, in alignment and, and you talk about alignment, aligning values, aligning of everything. Mm -hmm. Do you think that helps a photographer when I, let me back up just a little bit. To me, commercial photography has always been a process of solutions. Always having a challenge that I have to provide a solution for, usually visual, but sometimes outside that realm as well. As a graphic designer, still visual, but a lot had to do with marketing and understanding people and that type of thing, psychology. Mm -hmm. But with photography, it's always visual. And I find that when I would have my best shoots, it's when I was more or less aligned with my values, with my own personal uh, vision, and all the things that make me me. And I, I would try to move that to the next job that maybe wasn't good, all that for me, but try to find that state, flow, or whatever we want to call it that we can bring out. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, thoughts on that? Oh, boy, do I ever. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> you know me. I'm not short on, on, um, on sharing here. Let's, let's just take a moment because we know that the energy that we hold – is the energy we attract. And that isn't a misnomer. That is very much my experience. And once again, our energy shifts back and forth. But what happens is that when we continue to put our attention on moving our, on noticing what energy we're in and consistently moving it into high frequency, we become in that moment what our intention is, and that is to be in that highest, that's highest state of, of energy. And over time, our core, our personal vibration raises because we're continually bringing the, we're continually shifting from low frequency into high. And so if a photographer finds themselves attracting people who aren't paying, who are paying late, who aren't respecting them, who um, aren't collaborating perhaps in the way they'd like to. They need to look at their own energy and see what they're projecting out. Are they paying their vendors on time? Are they collaborating with their clients or is it my way or the highway? So very often when we're attracting a certain kind of energy, that's the energy that we're projecting out somewhere else in our life. So the more our values are aligned with the highest element of who we are, the more opportunity we have 
to st- w- will be in high vibration and the more opportunity we have to attract people and the type of accounts. Now, let me share with you a great example of this. In my 35 years of consulting, just consulting, because I consulted for 35 years, and I know I could look a little younger than most people might think. So, <laughs> or I, at least I make myself feel better saying that, because um, I am 69. Of the 35 years that I was a consultant, there were three photographers I had to ask to lose my number politely. And every single one of them was grounded in negativity. And I very kindly explained to them that it did not matter what marketing advice, pricing advice, copyright advice, building a portfolio advice I would give them. Nothing was going to help them because they were so grounded in nothing's going to work and the industry sucks and all these clients stink and life just is really horrible. And and I wouldn't work with them because I didn't want to take their money because I had learned early on that when people are that grounded, and we're not talking about people that float back and forth. We all have bad days. We do. Sure. But people who are not, and we all know who these photographers are. They show up at industry meetings. They're the ones with their hands up. They're the people online. We're always posting that the world is, is going to do. There was nothing I could do for them. And so when you're in that place, there's nothing that anybody can do, which is why it's so important that you don't allow yourself to sink into that kind of a sinkhole. I can give you an exact example. I shared space with a photographer for five years. He was a good, competent commercial photographer. Now we're talking back in the day when uh, he wasn't a creative photographer, but he could swing and tilt a view camera and he could Mm -hmm. nail the color and he would get jobs from like Safeway to shoot the inserts and everything. And he hated everybody. Mm. Every problem he had in his business was because art directors sucked. um, Safeway sucked. The guy was making $2,000 a a week, $2,000 a week in 1986, 2000 a week, Mm -hmm. shooting cans of vegetables and stuff one day a week. And it was maddening. It was a, 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 a hell of a day. But it was $2,000. Well, most people have been happy with 2000 a month in 1986. Mm-hmm. And his vibration, his total, you know, he gave me a cup once for my birthday that said, it was it, um, into, each, into each life a little rain must fall, right? We've heard that saying. And on the back said, followed by damaging hail and high winds. I mean, he was that guy. He's not a photographer anymore. Mm -hmm. He went into carpentry. He's not a carpenter anymore. Mm -hmm. Everything was negative. And it was everyone else's fault. And that's a hard place to be. That's a hard life to have. And, And that's the other piece of it, because we're not just talking about business. And it goes back to the book I wrote, How to Succeed in Commercial Photography, being a lifestyle book. And yes. this book, Raise Your Frequency, Transform Your Life, I think is a lifestyle book because it's asking us and instructing us, very much instructing us how to change our frequency and what are the tools we can use. And that's so important because we want to have a life that is grounded in the goodness. Now, we understand that today we're all living in very difficult times. There's a lot of um, a lot of disparity. There's a lot of a lot of um, polarity in our world. But really, when you get down to speaking to people, I don't care what political fence there they sit on, what side of the fence they're on. People generally are good people. We have people that have experienced all kinds of craziness and difficulty and have made poor decisions in their life. And, and the, you know, there are people out there that we may not want you know, to be our best friends, but people in general are really good. And we want to lead a good life. We don't want to sink into the negativity. We want to create a life where we're responsible for ourselves, And we make choices that 
really build upon each other in a very positive way. And so it's not as if I see the world in rose colored glasses. I do not. I've just come out of healing a brain injury after 11 years. Um, I know difficulty, but I also know what moved me through and took me to having a book published on my very first year back was the fact that I did not use my brain injury as an excuse. I lived beyond my circumstances. I saw where they were, I knew what I had to do, but I lived beyond them. And that's part of what the book teaches us. Regardless of your financial situation, your health, your partner uh, relationship, or how much business you have, you have the choice to move that forward. There will always be people who are successful, even in difficult markets. And those people are not only the people that understand what a customer wants, and they provide that via a visual product and at an appropriate pricing and good marketing, but they also have a great attitude. You know, when I was an agent, the last photographer I repped was the top one of the top photographers in Boston at the time. And back then there were only four top photographers. There are many now. Um, and I was always a pretty positive person. Um, I knew nothing when I started being his agent and luckily he trusted me and I appreciated that. But what I found Don was that I would bring people in and they loved his work, but, but he had a very different attitude. And I had art directors saying to me, listen, you know, I love the lunches. I love the work. I love working with you. But, you know, this guy, I have a really hard time with his attitude. And so it was hard for me because he wasn't in alignment with positive thinking. And eventually he and I didn't work together. Um, so I got to see firsthand how even when I was out there bringing people in, they weren't staying because he was just too difficult, very much of a prima donna. The, the prima donnas sometimes make it through, um, but most of the time they don't because the work has to be incredibly exceptional for the prima donna. I've seen it here in Phoenix. We've had photographers, you know, who just believe that they were so much better and they, they'll do wild they do well for a while, but they don't have longevity. And um, other folks like Rick Gale here in Phoenix, Rick's a, I mean, he's just a guy that you'd want to go out and have a beer with any day of the week. Really nice man. Doesn't look down on anyone. And he's still going strong at uh, 72. Uh, still shooting. I, I like that, that kind of people. I think the, um, the energy that you talk about uh, helps release creativity as well. That, well, that alignment, because it's hard to be creative when you're constantly fighting battles. Or if you're in worry or if you're in depression. Um, and I want to be so clear. There are times people are in worry and there are times people are depressed. And I don't want to make light of that. And I don't want to downplay that. Um, I do want to suggest that when that occurs, that help is there and help is needed, whether it's therapy, which is incredibly helpful. I had suggested that to clients for years in my 30s. I did 12 years of therapy. It was unbelievable. And if you're directed towards spiritual guidance, that is very helpful, too, when it comes to working with frequency and understanding things outside of the history that has gotten you there. Um, so there are times clearly where people are going to be in difficult times. And that's when, once again, we can shift our energy as best as possible with the, the tools that are provided and take us out of that because you're absolutely right. Creating the whole concept um, that artists have to be poor and artists have to be miserable in order to create, I think was uh, put aside many years ago, you know, in the eighties, um, the Boston music scene was a big deal. And there were groups like Jay Giles and Aerosmith and the Cars. And my husband at the time, my ex-husband, my first husband was um, a rock drummer and they were all our friends. And so I had an interesting experience once just, just watching all of these groups and what had happened. When, when Aerosmith got um, sober, I remember Stevie Tyler saying one night, you know what? 
I always thought I had to get up there drunk. I always thought I had to be high. I was always afraid of performing straight. And what I've discovered is performing straight is better than anything. So the whole idea of, you know, artists having to suffer is something we want to let go of. It's an, it's an old antiquated, um, antiquated thought that just doesn't hold up. So yeah, we want to be creative. We want to be in a place where we can be open and we can be able to bring in ideas and collaborate. We can collaborate with people when we're not in fear because very often photographers, when they're, you know, they don't want to give up control of the project, even if it's a commercial job. Collaboration is people coming together. So being in positive frequency, which is very, you know, very tangible. We know when we're not feeling well and we know when we are and the emotional body becomes this regulator and an announcer to let us know where we're at. So sure, we want to be in an open state so we can create. That's, that's so true that, that um, being open, it's like that I was talking about flow. You know, artists talk about flow when you get into flow. I mean, there'll be times when I'd be working on something, some project, I looked up, it's two o'clock in the morning and I'm thinking, right. oh, I, it's, I, I thought it was like 9.30 yeah. to get into this. Well, you can bring yourself to that. You can find those triggers to bring yourself into those moments like that, but you can't do it if you are so, if you've procrastinated to the point where you can't think about tomorrow because you're focused on what you didn't do today for yesterday. That that's what, will block everything. Yeah, that's what we call being present. You know, I've had so many photographers tell me, and you know, way back when I started as a photographer, that's how I got into this. I, I loved photography and I went to photography school and it was so exciting for me. I, I, my first husband, the gentleman I just mentioned, we lived in a very tiny apartment in Cambridge and, and we had this tiny room off the kitchen, like really, like it turned around, there was another wall. Well, he turned it into a dark room for me when we had film back then. And it would, there was no insulation in this apartment. It was a very cold in the winter, very hot in the summer. And that room was like beastly. But I would go in there to print and I would come out hours later, not realizing, as you just said, it was hours. And that's because I was uber present. Photographers have told me, I have a great photojournalist. I work with Andre Chung. He won the um, RFK award last year. He's an amazing photographer. Uh, look him up, Andre Chung. And he is so uber present in the moment of shooting. A lot of my my clients in the studio mention that, that when they're doing fashion or when they're doing portrait, they're so present with the person that they're photographing that nothing else exists. Well, that state of presence that's created in that moment can be created throughout our day. But it's harder for photographers to do that and what, what the book does is it shows them how to do that as well. That's an, that's an important book. That's an important thing for everybody. Um, your, your book is, I'm sure, it's not necessarily just for photographers because I think everybody. Oh, there you go. There's Andre. Good for you. That was cool. You're right on top of it, Don. Look at that. Andre is a phenomenal photographer, and uh, we went from just editorial to commercial. This is the shot. I'm looking at it. Oh, go! Can you go back for a sec? I don't know. It's a slideshow. Okay. Oh, it's his slideshow. Okay. The shot of the fist, that was the RFK um, award winner. Yeah. But he has this incredible way of shooting portraits and um, social justice, and he's you know just a really, really top talent. The lighting is wow, beautiful. Great. Right? I, I'm not familiar with his work, but wow. That's the shot. That's the shot that won the RFK award. This one here? And the RFK, yeah. And the RFK award is right under the Pulitzer. It's the most important okay. award in photojournalism, you know, next to the Pulitzer. Well, He's just some of us, some of us may say, would say it's actually more important than the Pulitzer. All right. Go um, for it. Politics involved in the Pulitzer were not so much. And the RFK. This is beautiful. Um, the, I, by the way, the RFK 
thing. I got to I got to ask you. This is this is like this is Don's um, ADHD moment. You know, silver shiny thing. Um, I I got to witness and see up close uh, the Paul Fusco photographs of the RFK mm. uh, funeral train. Mm. And if you haven't seen them, if you, if you have the show ever comes, you must go see them. They're incredible. Oh. Twenty by twenty four Cibacrones from his his uh, thirty five millimeter shots. And uh, I was standing in back of a group of photographers who were picking them apart because they weren't sharp. Mm. Now, when you're shooting tw a ASA twenty five, and it was ASA in those days before ISO, it was ASA twenty five mm. Kodachrome from a moving train. Mm. Chances are they're going to be a little soft. Mm -hmm. But you're dealing, I mean, at F4, your shutter speed's like a hundred, you know, um, but they are so spectacular. And all that time between RFK's funeral train and the eight years ago that I saw this show, that's a mm -hmm. lot of time. And I still cried. I, mm -hmm. I, my eyes teared up. I've never You'll seen have to anything watch that. like that. Have to watch that. Just incredible. Go to his, um, I know we're not here to look at Andre's work, but just go to the celebrity portraits. Just breeze through a couple of them because he has such a consistency. I edited and paginated this in a certain way. Um, but there's just a lot of, lot of emotional content here. And these are all celebrities that he's photographed he on assignment. He, he, he doesn't say who they are, right? Um, I think, no. I don't know that he does, no. I don't, I don't see There it might anywhere. be, there might be, so I'm not really familiar with that aspect of it. Yeah, no. Cool stuff. And you say he's in Boston or New York? No, he is in Baltimore. In Baltimore. fact, when the bridge went down, remember how the Baltimore yeah. bridge went down? He was uh, he was there for that and uh, covered that whole story for the Washington Post, I believe. Yeah. So he does commercial and editorial and editorial some and social justice. Yep, social justice. He started as a photojournalist. I actually met Andre through another photographer named Tim Ivy twenty five years ago, and I really wanted to help Tim Ivy, who was very very talented. Um, and, and photographers of color have a very hard time getting hired and have a very hard time getting assignments back then. And still now, I mean, it's turned a little bit, but let's not, let's not fool ourselves. Um, so I had them both at my house for a weekend and I sat and I gave them marketing advice for two days and then brought photographers, Lou Jones and other photographers in Boston. We had dinner at my house. It was so much fun. And then Andre became a client years later. So I got to watch his career grow and his talent grow. And he's done a great job. And he's a very positive person. And he's also a person that hasn't had an easy life either. None of us have at certain times. But he has superseded that, which is one of the reasons I wanted you to see this complete body of work because he is somebody who hasn't had an easy ride. He is a photographer of color and he wasn't hired on a lot of projects. He didn't have access to it until recently. And he's really just kept his, his, his um, positivity and kept going and is really, you know, on a good roll. Yeah. Beautiful work. Yeah. Yeah. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. And I think it's also important because he does what's important to him. He's authentic. This is heart is in the social justice, but he's moved beyond that. So the whole idea of, of being positive and being grounded in who you are and really making sure that your, your focus, your attitude, your at what we call an attitude is really your energy. It's your frequency. It's, it's keeping it positive so that you can move forward in that energy instead of in the energy of negativity, which doesn't return the same thing at all. Uh, that's interesting. The energy of positivity gives you positive returns. And I think the energy of negativity brings you more negativity. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I it's, ride a it's... motorcycle. Uh, so does Derek, just who is on my screen just below you. Derek and I both ride motorcycles. And there's one thing about riding a motorcycle that you learn real early. The motorcycle goes where you look. 
Mm. Not where you steer, where oh. you look. So really? if, you're gonna go, if you're going into a, a, a situation where there's a wall in front of you and you look at the wall, you'll hit the wall. If you say, okay, I'm going to look over there and you lean the motorcycle, you'll find that motorcycle will lean farther and turn sharper than you can imagine. Hmm. But if you look, because if you look where the, over there, that's where you'll go. Now, if hmm. you're going 80 miles an hour and the things right no, that's not going to count. But in most cases, it goes. And that life is a motorcycle. You go where you look. If you steer to the places that you want to be by looking at them, understanding them, bring them into your life, you'll get there. No promises on getting there next out in the next right. hour or three weeks, but you'll eventually get there. And you also have to have this skill, I'm assuming, yes. to know how to drive the motorcycle, to know how to steer it, to know how to move with it, right? Yes. And it's and I love this because it's the same thing with energy and, and the way we move through the day. So we automatically have, as motorcycles do, the capacity. We have within us two energy fields. We have the low frequency energy of the pain body, the egoic energy, and we have the high frequency of love. And while we all have different personalities and different histories, we have different trajectories, different bodies, we have different likes, different levels of talent, we all have consistently the energy of love within us. That is the only consistency we have as energy and form as human beings. So we have that capacity. And then we need to learn, as we need to learn how to ride a motorcycle, as we need to learn how to use a camera, as we need to learn how to do the science of photography. That's the equipment, that's light, that's composition. We need to learn how to do that. And then what we need to do is how to, once we have all the learned part down, we need to open up and stay in the frequency of the divine within us and of the, the love within us which is very accessible to us, mm -hmm. but we have to access it. So it's kind of like a motorcycle. We have this innate ability, and then we have to apply the instruction from the human part of us to be able to access that and utilize it. Yes. You know, we have this energy, but it's underused. So we have a whole tool bag within us of underused um, tools that I call high frequency that we get to access and keep us in high vibration. If you don't know how to ride the motorcycle, doesn't matter where you look, you're not going to get there. You have you know, to know how to, to run your body. Well, prior to my car event, I don't know if I'd get on a motorcycle now because I'm still just learning how to drive 11 years later, but the last time I was on a motorcycle, oh my God, I was in heaven. I was behind Zoli, who used to come to one of my meditation groups. And he was this very handsome Hungarian guy. And we were going off to a yoga retreat for just a day. And he was driving. So I got to be passenger, right? I got to just zip through the universe, which is what it felt like. I felt like I was a warrior zipping through the universe. It was the most exciting thing ever. And I didn't have to think about traffic because that was his job. So I loved my last motorcycle ride. It was incredible. Well, yeah. I Do you still you, go on yours? Yeah. There's, there, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Derek and I were talking uh, earlier in the week about finding a place to meet up. You should he's meet in, up here. You can take me for in, a ride. <laughs> That's a long meetup. It is a <laughs> long ride. It's a long ride, but it's nice here in the summer. Yeah, it's a long ride yeah. to Boston. <laughs> yes. We have a few, we have a, a couple of folks here, and I'd like to find out if they have any questions for uh, for you. And by the way, the book is if you want to buy the book, it's right down here. It's at Amazon. Just click away right in here, and you'll whisk over to Amazon. And uh, PD, is in, is that going to be an audio book? At any point, there is an audio book already on there. Yeah, there, oh, is, there is. And I, I, yes, and I did not record it, which I would have loved to. I have a fabulous publisher, but that was one mistake they made. They didn't ask me, and I would have loved to have recorded that because um, I think that's important. But there is, there's an audio, there's an ebook, and there is the print book. 
Yeah. And we have 10 five, star, 10 five star reviews already, and it's only been up for a couple of days. So there's a Kindle, an audio book, and um, not, a, not an email, but a, a Kindle and a print book. Yeah. Okay. So we have Mike and Derek and, and Zhao, Polo, Zhao Mr. Is in, Polo. Uh, Zhao is in uh, Portugal. Oh, you've got it. Yeah, yeah, so we're going to put people on the on the spot here. Anybody got a question? What just, are you thinking? Just, just, just um, well, just, just some small comments from my side. Uh, because I, I've heard, I've heard about uh, polarization. I've heard about uh, love. I've heard about uh, uh, being negative. Um, and and to be honest, the the. The love topic it's it's something that uh, it's something that we 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 talk so much so much with uh, just with open mouth, uh, but we don't really stop to think what 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 it is that we are talking about, and in most cases from from my perspective obviously, uh, there's a there's a huge misconception about what uh, what love is about so and 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 i think or what what i percept around me is that most of the time when i hear talking about love um i don't feel empathy uh from the start from uh, who i'm hearing mentioning the 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 the, the word uh, at all and uh, and and that's where it should all start. So it uh, because if you are empathic, if you if you have that, uh, if that's your drive, uh, so that that's basically the foundation of uh, of uh, of what uh, of what love uh, is or should be. Uh, but again, this is my this is my this is my perception of of the thing. Uh, it it can I can be completely wrong, but that's that's uh, at least that's how I I I, I see the the the, the thing, um, and and that's where I see actually negativity coming from. So it's it's from I, I think people are completely lost these days. So they 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 hear about it they want to feel it but they don't feel it uh and, and it's hard if you if you are on that uh, on that on that path that's that uh, i think you're so ja, i think you're yeah. right and when you say a lot of people are lost when i look at what's going on in in the in the world of ai right now and mm -hmm. read what the people of ai and their their attitudes. Uh, it's frightening to me that someone could be that less empath em empathetic. Mm -hmm. uh, the one of the founders of OpenAI said OpenAI will get rid of a lot of creative jobs, and maybe they shouldn't have existed anyway. Oh, that's which is nice. just a terrible thing to say. But well, Zhao, Zhao, you know, I, I feel that it's really, um, I'm sorry, Don, did I cut you off? No, I didn't mean no. to. Okay. I thought you were done. Okay. So what I want to share with you is I love what you shared. And I, I'm so appreciative of that. In my experience, the energy of love shows up as empathy. It shows up as patience. It shows up as kindness. It shows up as understanding. It shows up as, un as tolerance. It shows up as compassion. And so love, the energy of love, love is such um, an overused word in some respects, but it's important because it is this descriptive word of that high frequency within us. And so when people are really grounded in that energy, when that is important for them to project out, it can show up in any one of those states, just like fear, Joe, is procrastination, it's anger, it's jealousy, it shows up as impatience, intolerance, a lack of understanding, a lack of empathy, a lack of compassion. And I think we're all capable of all of that. And I think we, we all experience all of those states. 
And I think it's how we choose to respond to them. And that's what the book is about. It's not about whether or not that the energies come to you. There a variety of experiences are going to happen to anybody. It's about how we choose. It's our self-responsibility of how we choose to respond to those difficulties. And when we respond to them from any of those manifestations of love, then we're shifting our frequency and we're projecting that out. And our ne- this is what I love so much. Our next moment is not created from the chaos that lands. Our next moment is created from our response to that. Mm -hmm. And that to me is huge. Our next moment is created from our response to whatever has landed in our world. And so if a client comes along, if if you're calling a client, they're not able to get on Zoom with you to see your portfolio, I'm not saying you would do this, Joe, but if if a photographer, you know, was like really irritated and really, oh, here we go again, that's projected out whether they know it or not. Um, They're going to create that that energy is within their body as they say, okay, no problem. Let's look at another date. But if a photographer is able to say, okay, you know, I get it. You know, you're busy. I love that you're busy because it means I might, you know, have more assignments down the line and it means the industry is healthy. Good for you. I'm glad you're busy. Can we look at next week? Then you're, you're inviting them, not just with your words, but with the energy behind it. And we all know energy because we pick up on it every day. There's, um, An example I give, like if you were being invited to a party by a friend and you were meeting your friend at the party and you got to the party a little early and it was in full, you know, full tilt and you kind of stand in the door and you don't see your friend. So you start to look around and you go, "Okay, well, where shall I start my conversation? And you kind of look around and you don't know anybody in that room and you start to look around. You go, "Okay, well, those two people look interesting that means you're picking up on energy that appeals to you and you start walking over to them to have a conversation that's because you picked up on a vibration now you could go over there and it could be a great conversation or it's not and if it's not too interesting energetically and otherwise you're going to leave and you're going to be gravitating toward another group of people with more energy so we're always dealing with energy we're picking it up when you direct talent what are you doing? You're, you're directing them to remember if you're a good photographer and you're, you're, you're creating a moment for a commercial client. You've hired a model and it's not, you don't want the model to look modely. You want them to hold an emotion. You direct them to close their eyes. You direct them to remember this moment that has to do with the directive in your creative comp. You're, you, you direct them to remember this moment where they were lost, where, where life wasn't great. And you ask them to hold that feeling in their body and open their eyes as they hold it, because that's what you're capturing on the camera you know, that feeling. So that's energy. So you're used to dealing with energy when you're directing talent. You're out there shooting in the street. You want to get, you know, you you see what's going on in a demonstration as Andre did. You know, he's not going out there with any preconceived notion of what he wants to get. He's going out there and he's attuned to the energy. Where is it? Let me shoot that. Let me shoot a variety of things that are going on. It's all energy. So what we're doing here is we're using energy that we're already very familiar with, believe it or not, in a very different way. And we're hopefully responding from the energy of love because I think that you're absolutely right. There's an awful lot of talk. That's why I wrote this book. And I think there's an awful lot of talk because some people just like to talk, but other people don't know how to access this energy. They don't, they, they could listen to conversations like this and say, well, that's great, but what do I do with it? Where do I go from here? And that's why I wrote a workbook, not a novel. I wrote a book that teaches us how to access it because we need to know how to do that in order to be able to step into it. Well, when you talk about response to a situation, I'm reminded about how many times I'll talk to a photographer and go, well, I showed my book to this agency um, they didn't they didn't like it. Well, why didn't they like it? Well, they didn't hire me. And you know, before I was a photog- before I was an ad agency owner, I would maybe commiserate with, oh, it's really sucks. Then you become an ad agency and you realize we don't hire every photographer that we like. We don't have that much work. We were 
we were a two and a half million dollar agency, but we weren't doing photo shoots every week or, or you know, it might be a month between photo shoots. Some would be illustrations, some would be just working on text and copy, whatever. And, and I, I would say to them, well, how many times have you shown it? Well, just that once. I said, well, the time to get really worried about they don't like your book is when you showed it to them 10 times. Because any salesperson will tell you that you have to show your work eight to 10 times to get a response. So instead of feeling bad about the seventh time you've shown your book to that agency, you feel bad, get excited, man. You're only three away. You've cleared up those first eight goof ups. Now you're ready to get to get in there. You can change how you feel about any situation by reverse engineering what's really going on. And you know, Don, when it comes to showing portfolios as well, and I know that wasn't necessarily the point of your um, example, and thank you for what was, but I think also there are ways photographers can elicit responses and should. You know, mm -hmm. I used to take my clients through mock portfolio presentations and I'd play the client, they'd be the photographer. And I, and I, then we would go backwards and I would show them as a photographer what they should, you know, what I was suggesting they might do because it's, it's a conversation, mm -hmm. you know, you want to find out, well, what are you working on and how often do you, might you use this kind of work? And is this the kind of work that fits in with the kind of work you either have now or you're looking to have in the future? So that way, you know, whether you should be coming back for you know those other appointments and I think th that's critical to to have that conversation and I don't think photographers are able to do that if they're in low energy if they're worried if they're concerned if they're not confident um, it's hard to have that conversation but when you're in a positive place then you realize we're all in this together that the clients need photographers and you're absolutely right um, especially now that photographers have been specializing for years. One agency may hire one photographer over and over and over for portraits and another one over and over and over for food and another one over and over for architecture, but they're not gonna hire the architecture photographer for the food shots. So right then and there, with, with when we went into um, specialization years ago, it, it was more important than ever before for photographers to have a broader marketing plan because they now had to market to more people to get fewer jobs just because of the specialization. So you bring up an excellent point that has nothing to do with energy, but has everything to do with being successful as a photographer, which is to understand the client's needs that you're selling to. And one of the best ways is to look at a portfolio visit as an adventure in information and not to look at it as a first date that's going to lead to a marriage. You know, I used to say to my clients, you know, I've been married twice and divorced twice. And both times I, as soon as I had a first date, I had a relationship and it just worked out that way with those two men. Um, but in the future, I think I would handle it a little differently. And I don't want photographers to look at one portfolio visit, as you just said, and expect a job to come from it, because this is a relationship that you're investing in, which is why photographers front end their financial and their time investment before work comes in. That's the nature of this business. We front end with our time and our financial investment before the return happens three to five years down the line. And it is sometimes three to five years, which yes. doesn't mean you're not going to work. It just means that that's how much time it sometimes takes in order for photographers to have built the business, which is which is successful, which is in alignment with what the Small Business Association says, which is five to 10 years for any small business. Yes, it takes about five to 10 years for that overnight success to pop in. Yeah. Out of preparation. Yeah, Derek. Uh, yeah. So, um, and, you know, I have a superpower of being able to wake up ready to dig myself out of a hole of uh, what you call low energy access, I guess. But I, I find that, you know, if you can practice gratitude, a lot of times work your way out and, and you keep on moving. What are your and you may cover this in the book, but what do you do? You have any daily habits to get yourself in that mindset? Do you have any practices? What do you what do you do on a daily basis to keep yourself in that? mindset I think of such an energy. 
Yeah, such an excellent question, Derek. Um, first of all, I love gratitude and I love what I call active gratitude. So here's, here's a practice I have moment to moment, okay? So we are a combination of um, elements. We're not a me or an I, we're not a one dimensional person. We have all of these dimensions. And this is important because all of these moving parts have everything to do with these practices I'm about to share with you. But we have a physicality, we have a physical brain, we have a personality, we have a history in this body, we have an emotional body, we have a thinking mind, and then we have our energy fields, the low frequency of pain, the high frequency of love. And I'm using these terms just so that we can talk about them. If we see ourselves as a multidimensional being, we're able then to know that if we recognize that we're in low frequency, what part of us do we need to work with? So the first thing I do is um, I have I have a practice. I get up in the morning and I don't get out of bed for an hour. It takes me a while to wake up. I meditate in the morning. And the first thing I do is I look at after I do my uh, practices and my meditation, uh, I look at my phone and I look at the day. I look at the calendar and I see what's there. And if there's anything that's a pinch point, like maybe I need extra time to go to the airport or I have two back-to-back -back appointments. And if one, I usually like to keep a buffer between my appointments, but if one goes longer, it might be um, hard. And I know this person that I'm seeing may go on a little longer. What I do is I look at any pinch points and I start to visualize them and I don't see it in my mind. I don't use my brain. I use my seeing and my knowing, which is a different aspect. It's my high frequency. I go to my high frequency, I check in, and I start to visualize that situation going smoothly. I have plenty of time to get to the airport. The roads are clear. So I vibrationally set the tone for my day. That's the first thing I do, Derek. Second thing I do is I meditate in the middle of the day. I take a whole hour off. Some people have lunch. I have a meditation break. And I meditate for an hour because I after being in the third dimensional world, I need to go back into connecting to the high frequency. So I like to stay in contact with that energy of love within me. Um, I also am constantly moment to moment noticing what my state is. So I check in consistently throughout the day. Um, one of the practices you can use if you're not familiar with how to read your energy is to set your, to once again, look at your phone, look at your day ahead and set three alarms on your phone. One in the late morning, one in the middle part of the day and one in the evening. And when these alarms go off, you're gonna take 30 seconds to a minute, that's it. And you're just checking in, where's my head? Is it calm, is it centered, is it full of things? Am I on the hamster wheel? Am I depressed? Am I anxious? You check in with your emotional state. How's my emotional state? Am I fragile? Am I feeling good? You check in with your physicality, with your body. And you're just noting. You're not changing anything. You're just noting and you go back into your day. This tiny piece of awareness adds up. And after a couple of weeks, you might start doing that every hour on the hour just noticing. And before you know it, you're going to be in constant of awareness. This is what we call in the world of spirit, witnessing as you be. You're building your conscious awareness as you move through the day. So that's important because if you don't know where you're at, if you're not watching as you're not witnessing as you be, Derek, you have no idea where you're at and you don't know if you do need to shift. So those are some practices. When it comes to shifting, there's lots of things in the book, but I will tell you that one of, for me, one of the most immediate ways to shift my energy. And I'm an emotional woman. I'm a woman who feels things very, very deeply. So when I need to shift, I go to gratitude. Because even in the worst days, the darkest days of my brain injury, when, when taking a shower, was um, a big deal because I went from leading a very active life to being completely stopped and couldn't do anything for five years. Um, holding a conversation was a big deal. So going to gratitude, even then, there was so much I could be grateful for. But I'm not talking about just sitting and thinking, no. Active gratitude is when you close your eyes, and you breathe in and out through the nose, which we call the breath of life, which is, I'm not going to go into it here, but it is one of the best 
amazingly transformative practices within five minutes to shift a state. But you go into breath of life and then you think of one aspect of your life that you are really grateful for and you feel in your body the gratitude. And then you remember a time within your, within your sensing where the gratitude was very present and you see all the details in your mind's eye, in your in your intuitive. Somebody is a little coming in here. And you hold that and then you feel in your body all of the experiences of gratitude from that moment. And then you come out of it. You cannot be in low frequency and go to gratitude and come out of gratitude and not be shifted. So you've re you're really on to something there, but it's how you utilize it. That's really cool. And that that's the price of admission right there. Right Thanks. there. That was absolutely gold. In fact, I'm going to pull that out of this video and make it a standalone. Well, it's very and, and try it. If it sounds too easy, if it sounds too new agey, you know, if it sounds like, oh, I've heard this before, you know, challenge yourself because you haven't necessarily heard that practice before in that way or maybe even if you have you most likely haven't done it so do it before you decide that it's not effective that's fantastic but derek you're really on to something very powerful all right well if we have time for one more and if not i'm going to let everybody go All right. Well, Selena, thank you so much for Pleasure. joining us today. Oh, it's a blast. Every time we do this, we say we should do this again. Yes, we should do this again. And we probably <laughs> yeah. will. So well, thank, thank you very you, much. Everybody, everybody look for uh, links down. If you're looking at this on YouTube, check for links down below.